All right, find Exodus 24, and we're getting up close to the design of the tabernacle, and I don't think that we will cover, well, just one part of uh, the typology of the tabernacle today. And that regards the title of the message, Where We Meet God, Where We Meet God. Because there is an abstract place. Uh, if we went to all of us and we, when we were to ask, you know, each of us our testimony and how we came to know Christ, and, you know, we, we would probably have a geographical location, most of us. And some don't exactly know at what point and where. And uh, a lot of hard-nosed preachers have preached over the years that if you don't know the exact time and the day and, you know, this and that and the other, then you're not saved. And, and that's just not true. You know, you could, two people could decide to leave here and go to Oklahoma City. One decided to, you know, uh, fly, and the other decided to drive. And they both got together in Oklahoma City, and, <clears throat> and the guy who flew asked the guy who drove, well, do you know when? You entered into Oklahoma. He said, oh, yeah, I saw the road got worse just after that. And then there was, you know, that it used to be true. Now Texas roads are about as bad as they've ever been, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and I remember the Red River, and there was a sign, and you're now in, entering into Oklahoma. And I, you know, had a distinctive place and time, and I know when it was. And, you know, and the other, you know, then he asked the guy who flew, he said, well, do you know when you entered into Oklahoma? He said, well, no, I don't. You know, he said, well, then how do you know you're in Oklahoma? He said, well, I, <laughs> I know I'm in Oklahoma, you know, and, that, and that's the truth. There are people who know the Lord, and they know they know the Lord, and they have evidence that they know the Lord. They have understanding from the Lord and communication from the Lord, but they cannot necessarily say when and where, but abstractly there is a place, no doubt, that each of us should know without any confusion where. We met the Lord, and it's probably going to take me at least an hour and a half to get to it, but uh, not really. I just want to scare you all this morning. <laughs> you might have said, oh, Lord, I should have had the sniffles too, you know. <laughs> but I just, I'm just kidding, kind of, you know. We'll see. Uh, you know, my Sarah always says, she said, Dad, don't say that you don't have much to say because then you always go forever, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, fair enough. You know, coming from a preacher's kid, I, I guess I don't blame her. But, uh, <laughs> but looking at Exodus chapter 24, and, and we're going to back up just a little bit because I ended rather abruptly in 23 last time because I was going for so long. You know, see, I, I really do think about y'all, and I have a clock back there, but uh, I'm just not that good about it. But um, back up just a little bit, and uh, maybe to 23... 31, he said, and I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea, uh, I'm sorry, from your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea of Philistia and from the desert to the river, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you and you shall make no covenant with them nor with their gods, they shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For I, for if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And let's pray. Father, God bless us to learn from the experiences and the mistakes of others. Bless us, Lord, to see ourselves in these examples that you've given us. As you said, you prescribed that these examples right here are for us, you said in your word in Corinthians. 
And let us not think about old so-and-so out there today who really needs to hear this message, but Lord, may we present ourselves before you. We're here for us and you, God. We're here, Lord, that we might be what you want us to be. That we might have your likeness, that we might have your spirit in all the fullness that you ever intended in order that, that, that when we do go out, Lord, that we would go out with might and power and with the Holy Spirit working in us. And we gather ourselves here together, Lord, not to think about how awful that world is out there, Lord, but as your word says, to provoke one another into love and to good works. And so we ask your blessing in that way, Lord. We ask for your grace, God, to teach us again and to show us again in a different light. And maybe you've already told us a hundred times, but tell us one more time. God, and bring us along. I, I'd love to say that we're so res responsive and, and diligent, Lord, but we're slow to learn and rather stubborn regarding our sin. But we have your promises, God, that you begin a good work in us and you'll continue it. And faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. And we do not come here, Lord, with confidence in ourselves. But, God, we're here because we have no confidence in ourselves and we need you. And we need your interference, Lord. And we need that miraculous work that you do in us to make us a little less like this world, God, and more like your son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, may we be your sons and daughters and behave like it. And may we have the voice of our Father in our lives today that we'd be a pleasing thing unto you in Christ's name. Amen. So backing up just a little bit, he gave him this instruction, and this is, you know, the book of the covenant. And it was presented here, and it was expanded upon later, and it was rehearsed again in Deuteronomy, and it was told again and again and again and over and over, and, and, and for good reason, because we didn't get it all the first time. And although we don't catch it, we may not realize it, but you know the Word of God is like drinking from a fire hose. There are so many concepts and principles and things that we, we do not have the capacity to apply, and God gives it to us a little bit at a time, just like he described in the last chapter. He said, little by little, I'll drive the inhabitants out of the land. And sometimes we're so goofy to, to think that, well, I wish that God would just lay on me all the, you know, we can't even uphold the instruction that he's given us until now. You know, I mean, everything that you know to do, you do, right, perfectly. You know what the scripture says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. You know, and I don't know about you, but I'm like, well, you know, to the point where Lord teach me slowly. <laughs> you know, teach me slowly because I can't keep up with what I know, you know, at the point. But he said, little by little, you know, you'll, you'll drive them out. And then he includes this other thing here at the end, and he gives them a little word of warning before he ends this book of the covenant. And he said that, he said, you shall not. I'm sorry, you shall make no covenant with them regarding the people, right? Nor with their gods, they shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. I think it was Adrian Rogers that said that the devil will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, make you stay longer than you ever wanted to stay, and cause you to pay more than you ever wanted to pay. And perhaps we've heard those testimonies from our Christian brothers and sisters, and, and they started off with some little innocent thing in their life, some little drink that they know they shouldn't have drunk, or some little text message that they know they should not have entertained, and, and one thing dominoed to another, and before they know it, they're off in full-blown alcoholism or in a, a, an adulterous affair or something like that. It never goes from zero to 100 overnight. You always hear about this little romance that took place, this little provision that was made in their life. 
the little thing that they entertained. And, you know, and if the devil gets his toe in your door, well, you be ready for the rest of it to all come in. And he made a warning to them, and he gave them that warning, much like God gave a warning to the kings of Israel, and don't collect a bunch of wives for yourself, because they're going to mess you up, is what he told them. You know, one's enough trouble. God tried to tell them, but they didn't get it, you know. And, and he, he warned them. He said, don't do it. There'll be a stumbling block unto you. And he warned them here. He says, this will be a stumbling block. And there's no such thing as one area of compromise. I think that's really important for us to know, because... If you take on the battle of sin in your life and you, and you want to please the Lord and you want to repent of your sins and, you want, and, you're, and you're actively engaged in that, and by the way, that's something we become actively engaged in for our life. You know, for our life, I bet we could go to our elders. You know, they're all pretty old, you know, except for me. I'm, I'm, I'm the young one. And, you know, if you asked them, you know, is the battle of sin over in your life? They'd say, no, not at all. I mean, more than ever, you know, I know what it is, and it's right before me, and I'm well acquainted with it, and I know what, what I can't do, and I know where not to go, and it, and it gets to a point. If you've ever done this, if you've ever you know, gotten to this point, and you've learned, and, and, and the Lord has caused you to grow, and you've overcome things, and you've gotten past habitual sins and things in your life, and, and you find one little area of compromise, and you think, well, that, that's it. Right? That's the only thing. Don't you know that that's just the first domino, and before you know it, you will have regressed 10 years in your spiritual walk and be back into the besetting sins that you had been free of for years. I don't know if you've lived it or not. I'm sad to say I have. You know, and go back, like, what in the world, and how did this all start? But don't you know when you grieve the Holy Spirit in your life that you forfeit the power and the strength that He gives you to walk in the Spirit and to walk in that victory? And when you find one little area of compromise, and He warned them, you know, how, how did He describe it? He described it with, and this is really, it's a great translation, a snare. They had a word for a snare because they caught badgers and all kinds of things out there in the desert. You know, they caught wildlife. and. And, and it was, it's a perfect translation. You all know what snares do. Snares don't just, like, hurt you. Because we'd like to think, you know, that little area, come, well, it might, it might hurt a little bit. You know, it's going to know it's worse than that. It's not like somebody came down the street and just sucker punched you, you know, and, and oh, that hurt. No, they came down the street, they sucker punched you, then they abduct you. A snare hurts, and then it, it entraps and that's the, that's the horrible thing about like a little area of compromise and a little provision made that before you know it, you'll be going backwards. And the things that you have once had victory over, you no longer have victory over. And you got to go back and you got to, you know, you got to, and a lot of times it's not really clear. Like you got to really think it through and like, how, how did I get back to this point? And, you know, and eventually you get back and say, okay, I know, I know where not to go. Right. I know where not to go. It's really easy. Like, you know, you can think in terms of alcoholics, you know, most of us could probably go home tonight and have a glass of wine or a beer and go on with our day and our life. And it wouldn't be a problem. And we wouldn't want to have another one tomorrow. And we wouldn't want to have 10 more after that first one. But maybe there's one or two of us. That know. I don't I honestly don't know if we have any recovering alcoholics, as we call them, you know, in here today. But I have brothers and sisters in Christ who are, who are alcoholics or recovering alcoholics, you should say. And they know. And they, you know what else they know? They know that taking a drink just doesn't mean that they'll fall back into alcoholism. They know that taking a drink puts them on a slippery slope of backsliding that, oh, there is, there is an al recovering alcoholic in this room, I forgot. Yeah, they know, they know that taking that one drink compromises so many things in their life. And it grieves the Holy Spirit that's within us. And when you start pushing Holy Spirit out, well, you start losing that power to walk in victory. In Galatians chapter, I think it's chapter 5, 16, maybe, something like that, that the Scripture teaches us to walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, and that the flesh, you know, lust contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit contrary to the flesh, and they're, they're at enmity with each other. You know, and he warned them, and you know, and he warns about various things throughout Scripture. You know, in regards like the kings and the and the plurality of wives, and 
<clears throat> and hear it to them. But I mean, that's my warning for us is, you know, what's our snare? What is the little thing that the devil knows? Because, you know, he's not going to come and all, you know, tempt us with a drink tonight. He knows we're not all alcoholics. No, it doesn't work for us. But I guarantee you, he knows what does work for you. Maybe he'll incite you to a little bit of bitterness. That person you really don't like, you know, or whatever it may be. And he, he's got a thousand ways, doesn't he, to do it. But he knows what kind of a snare and he'll lay it for you. But don't you know that, like the scripture says, you can't make any provision for the flesh. Because, boy, that's a compromise. And once you have that compromise, but that's the first domino. And it all begins going backwards from there. And if you want to walk in victory, you have to watch out for those compromises. You know what I think about? I think about those guys that spin plates. You ever see those guys? They, they get the, the rods, you know, and then they have plates, and they, they put a plate on a rod, and they spin it, and then they set that rod down, and that plate's up there, you know, and the, the gyrotic motion of it causes it to stand upright, you know, and he gets that one going, and he gets another one going, and then he gets another one going. You know what happens if he stumbles at one plate? They all start to fall. You know, and, and you know, you get away and you have to learn that what, what is that plate? What is that stumbling block for you? And where do you get stuck? And, and you're like, well, it's just this plate. It's just this plate. Clink. You know, it's like, plunk. And you watch your life starting to fall apart and your walk with the Lord start, you know, to implode. And you're like, well, what's going on? And you go back. And you're like, OK, I understand. I, I know where it was. Now I know what the snare is in my life. I think it's Hebrews chapter 12 that calls it a besetting sin. And that, you know, that very thing that gets to us. But onward, chapter 24, says, Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, the 70, what do I got under here? There we go. <clears throat> he said, And 70 of the elders of Israel, and he said, And worship from afar, that is them. You know, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, 73 worship from afar. And he said, And Moses alone you shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall people go up with him. Now, there, you know, there is a consistency, and I say this to, to warn against congregationalism, because you can look through Scripture, Old and New Testament, and you can look through church history, and you can find... That without a doubt, God works through leadership. You know, no matter how you want to slice it or do it, that God works through leadership. And God distinguished Moses as a leader. And there was a, quite a number. You know, even at times Aaron and Miriam, and there was the rebellion of Korah. And there was constantly the devil working through people and inciting people to compromise that leadership. Now, I'm not saying that leadership is infallible by any means. I'm saying what you better do is you better check out your leadership. And you decide whether or not you believe that they're of God and, and directed by God and in fellowship with God. And if you believe they are, well, then heed their leadership. And if you don't believe they are... Find another ministry, right? Get away from them. And go and go put your service and your resources in, in, in another ministry. Because that, you know, even when the disciples came to Christ and they said, you know, hey, Lord, there's other people that are speaking in your name. What, you know what he said? He didn't say, hey, go, you know, run down their ministry. Go interfere with them. He said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. And he said, they'll by no means do anything in my name without my power given, you know. He says, hey, don't worry about them. And I, and I just say that because, you know, there's so many congregational churches that have done so much damage for the name of Christ because they don't have any respect for leadership. Everyone is considered to be, and when I, when I say, con I mean congregationalism. I mean, like, the, you know, this idea that, you know, what, what ministry are we going to do? And, you know, and, and the church, like, uh, votes on it, you know, and there's not really everybody's considered an elder is really the way it works. Everybody's an elder. And I said, does everybody fall under the qualifications of elders? You know, it's like that. That's not scriptural. And, and they don't like that idea. And it really is something, you know, where that came from? You really want to know where that came from? It came from the Southern Baptist Convention. 
And the Southern Baptist, and, and I'm ordained Southern Baptist pastor, by the way. That's where I came up in, in ministry. I was first a Southern Baptist pastor. And it was long ago in the South, and there was some, some Baptists who owned slaves. And, you know, their Baptist convention said, hey, you can't own slaves and be a missionary. And they said, well, we'll form our own convention. And, and that's where they introduced, at least I know Congregational was introduced into that. Uh, into that denomination. And Spurgeon referred to them as benighted churches. <laughs> and he said these benighted individuals, you know, in the churches. But, you know, we, there is this place, and there is a place, and undoubtedly a place of leadership. And, boy, it doesn't stop. You know, there, there's a place in leadership beyond me. There's a place in leadership with three other elders here that I have to listen to and give heed to and you know, and beyond even that, there's, you know, there's people who oversee, although we're autonomous churches, you know, in Calvary Chapel. A man named Ron Hint at Friendswood down in Houston, Calvary Chapel, Houston. I, I consider myself to be subject to him. And I have to listen to him. And I need to, because, you know, he decides among some of the other, uh, others if we are to get disfellowshipped from Calvary Chapel Association or not. There has to be respect given unto leadership in the kingdom of God. And you have to determine, is this man a godly leader? And is he called of God? And is he doing the work of God? And, it, and then it is your responsibility to follow him or to not follow him or to, to you know, contribute or to not to contribute. And you need to evaluate them, but you need to understand that in all the history of God, and you look at all the movements of God, you always see God working through leadership. Always see God working through leadership. And it's something that we just cannot get around. It's very obnoxiously obvious. But there was Moses. And he distinguished Moses. He did. He did this on purpose to distinguish Moses. And he had to distinguish Moses over and over and over again, didn't he? Y'all remember the rebellion of Korah? And Moses is like, guys, don't do this. Guys, don't do this. And and they're like, well, we're doing it, you know. And, and the Lord told Moses, well, y'all all get together tomorrow and we're going to find out. And you'll remember the earth opened up and swallowed a great number of those, you know, that family and consumed them. And that's a tough way, right? That's a very tough way to, to learn something like that. <clears throat> but he said, Moses, Salone, he said, there shall come, uh, shall the people go up with him. So I'm sorry, nor shall the people go up with him. But verse 3, so Moses came and told the people, all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning. See, Moses didn't sleep in, did he? Uh, he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain uh, with 12 pillars. That's one for each tribe. According to the twelve tribes of Israel, then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and he took half the blood and he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Now, this is very much, this is God making a covenant. And you remember the way he made a covenant with Abraham, that Abraham, you know, they split these animals in two and the Lord passed between the two of them and that there was this shedding of blood for the making of a covenant. And the Old Testament teaching people and instilling their mind that in order for man to be restored to God, something, someone has to pay. Someone has to pay. And, and it's hard for us to get until we make it relative to ourselves and, and we think, well, what's an offense unto us? And if somebody comes in and commits a crime or, as, as the Scripture would say, a, a sin against us, maybe they break into your house and murder one of your family members. Maybe they burn down your house. Maybe they, they hurt you in some tremendous way. And you're like, well, what does there need to be restitution? Well, you're, well, someone needs to pay, man. Right? When, when you've been wronged, when you understand that you've been wronged and, and somebody sinned against you, you understand, well, some, something, someone needs to pay. 
You know, this isn't right. And God was teaching them so long ago in this covenantal relationship, even with Aaron, you know, and it's hard. It's, you know, I, I wish that everybody could have had an agrarian background and grow up. I remember as a little kid, us, you know, slaughtering our own chickens. And it's rough. And we didn't even know how to do it at first, right? And, you know, ever hear the phrase, you know, running around like a chicken with its head cut off? And I, re- I was probably six, seven years old, and I remember, you know, boom, the hatchet and just chopping the head off and that chicken hitting the ground and, you know, you know they kind of put their wings back and that chicken ran around, no head, you know. And, but it, it's rough, it's gruesome. And, you know, you, you want to eat? Well, go get Merle, the cow, out of the stall that you've been feeding. I mean, you know, we've raised our own pork now for, uh, for a few years, for five years. You know, and the girls are like, I don't, I don't want to feed the pig, you know. I don't want to feed the pig, you know. They're like, we don't want because, well, we know where it's going. We know what's going to happen. And so they didn't really want to interact with the pig, although when they're little piglets, they're so cute, you know. And I would go, I would be kind to the pig. You know, I'd go out and I'd scratch them on their belly, you know, and I'd love on them. And they're like, Dad, how can you do that? You know, I said, well, I understand it's for a purpose. You want to live? You want to eat? I think there's been a, a few memes online where people, I mean, in sincere naivety, would post, you know, I don't know why you all have to kill animals. Why don't you buy your meat where, you know, they, you know, from the store so animals don't have to die? And you're like, you, you don't understand how this works, do you? You know, and, and perhaps they'd like to say, well, you know why, you know, where well, I'm an extra good person because I'm a vegetarian, you know, or maybe if you want to go like extra hardcore, you're a vegan. That means you're a really good person, right? You know? That uh, you wouldn't even exploit cows for their milk or chickens for their eggs, you know. But and uh, but I'll tell you what that the Daniel fast wasn't something wonderful because it's healthy to be a vegan or a vegetarian. The Daniel fast was God's miracle. That was His intervention. That they still looked as good and as healthy, even though they did not have the fats and the proteins that are derived from animals. God actually had to do a miracle and intervene on their behalf because their diet was insufficient. And everybody knew that, and everybody understood and that. That's why they were amazed. They're like, oh, wow, you look just as healthy. But we don't understand that for our life that something has to die. You know, and, and that little piggy that you've been raising for seven or eight months, you know, and it went from being, you know, 30 pounds to 350 pounds. They grow fast, don't they? And... And then you're, you're hauling it off to the slaughterhouse. And you're like, man, that's rough. What, what, have you calculated Christ? And Christ is much more than a pig or a cow or something like that. And he was beginning to instill in their minds, listen, there is no covenant God. There is no covenantal relationship with God without the shedding of blood. And so here also... He had these oxen, and there was actually a more extensive list later in Scripture given regarding this, and and what he did in in you know in sacrificing these animals, and how the covenant was made with these animals. But he took half the blood, right, and just like it was put in halves, you know, at, with Abraham, and you know, and half for each, and that he, then he went and he sprinkled that blood, and you know, and a lot of people. Are, I don't, I don't know why, you know, a lot of commentators are really bothered by the idea that he sprinkled the blood on the people. They're like, no, he must have not sprinkled the blood on you. It must have been on the, on the pillars and, you know, in representation of the people. And I, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't know why they're so, I don't know why they're so offended at the idea that God, that Moses would go around and, you know, sprinkle blood on people. But, uh, but nevertheless, that's what he did. But what I want to point out is the naivety of the people, the naivety of the people. And I say that because there are our example. And I'll tell you what, I fell into this naivety too when I was a young Christian and I was very zealous for the Lord. And, and I made statements like this too. And you would think, you know, if you read it, you would give them an A plus, right? You just read this, you're like, oh, well, man, these people did great, didn't they? You know, twice they said, all the words which the Lord has said we will do. You know, and then again, afterwards, after you read the Book of the Covenant, that's where we get the term, by the way, right there, Book of the Covenant. 
and uh, referring to this law that he gave. There's the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and then what the past couple chapters were the Book of the Covenant. And then he read it to them, and then again they said, you know, in one accord, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. I don't know how you, how you respond to God, but I've learned not to respond that way. So, <laughs> because I feel really silly later. I feel really silly later. And I, not only that, but my confidence is misappropriated. You see, the trouble with thinking like that is you're confident in your own goodness. And you think that the sanctifying work in you is because of your committed spirit and your will. And I warn you about that because that, if that is your hope, I can guarantee you, you're going to grow spiritually at a minute rate. That is not the way to think. You know, they repeated this later with, with Joshua. And Joshua told him, choose you this day whom you will serve. And they said, well, we'll serve the Lord. And he said, you can't serve the Lord. He says, you've got all these idols in your tents. He said, you've got to put away the idols if you want to serve the Lord. He said, here you are. He said, your mouth is writing checks that you can't cash. And that's what the problem with that is, is, you know, your mouth writing checks that your heart can't cash, to make the phrase better, right? You know, if y'all know the phrase. But, um, but that, you know, so what, what do you do? What should you say? Maybe pray more along the lines this way or say, you know, God, by your work through me, teach me to be obedient. God, work in me to bring me to the place. God, conform me unto the likeness of your Son. And you understand that the, 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 the transformation that takes place in you is by God's grace. It's by God's grace that he brings you along, right? You know, and sometimes we're really responsive and we walk with him. I, I, I can remember, work, you know, dealing with horses and, you know, and, and working with mules, you know, and one thing about horses and mules, you know, that they have tendencies among individual horses and mules. There's some horses and mules that never want to work with you. There's some that most of the time want to work with you. And there's some that want, you know, some days they'll work with you and some days they won't. And I think that that's what I've been like with God for the last 25 years or so is that, you know, you could go out to the corral and with a lead rope and a halter and put it on a horse and... If it's time to get oats, oh boy, you know, yeah, you know, they're, they're like, let's go, you know, and, and they're walking along, you know, but, but if, if there's no oats involved, you know, they, you know, you have to pull them and they, you know, and they stretch out their neck and then they're like, oh, you know, okay, I'll go along. And same thing, you get a mule chain behind you, maybe they'll come along willingly and, and maybe sometimes you got to drag them along and bring them along. But I feel like that's been my life with God, that there's been times when I've been really responsive and, and engaged with him. That's not been the normal. But I tell you what, there's been a huge amount of time when I've been slow and I've been stubborn and he's been, you know, diligent and patient, sometimes with kindness and long suffering and, and sometimes a little swat on the backside to, hey, get yourself in gear. But it's, it's the grace of God. It is the grace of God. I don't think that, you know, we can't take any merit for the sanctifying work that happens to us. You know, the only explanation we can give, you know, like, Jeff, why aren't you a criminal anymore? Jeff, why aren't you a, a drug user anymore? Jeff, why aren't you a liar anymore? And I'd have to tell you, it has very nothing to do with my commitment. It has to do that I surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's been his intervention and his grace that has been at work in me. And I can't say... I would dare not say that, I'm, you know, I'm going to obey the Lord this week. I say, by God's grace, Lord, cause me to serve you this week. God, intervene in my life. Lord, take action. Do what you need to do. You know, you know make me to be that person. And it's a very different attitude in which, you know, and what's the difference? If you're the one doing it, guess who gets the glory? When you know that it's God that is at work in you, both to will and to do what is his good pleasure, who gets the glory? Mm, is God. God did it. 
That's how it was done. God did it. But they, you know, they answered in all this false confidence. Oh, yeah, we're going to do it. We'll do it. We'll obey the Lord, you know, and and little did they know. And, and by the way, they very well could have been absolutely sincere. I can tell you totally truthfully, there was a time in my life when I was absolutely sincere. You know, God, I'll never do that again. And I really thought that I was, you know. I was so full of baloney, I didn't even know. You know, you don't even know. We don't know ourselves right that well. You ever hear something like that from your kid, and you're like, yeah, I know, I know you got good intentions, but <laughs> you're full of baloney, you know? Uh, but, you know, they might be very sincere, but we need to learn. We need to understand who we are. We're not the goodness of God, right, that leads to repentance. It's God's goodness that leads us into repentance. And Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and he said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. And of course, you know the covenant which we are under today. That the Lord, the night that he was betrayed, that he took the cup and he said, This is the covenant of my blood. And that's the blood that ultimately that, that they were supposed to be looking forward to. That is the blood, you know, Hebrews teaches us that the blood of bulls and goats was like a, it was like a temporary thing. And it was only pointing to, you know, the Christ event, as we call it in, in theology, that it was pointing to that there's going to be another one. There's going to be a different blood. There's going to be one coming. And it's that blood that makes the covenant that we have, that covenant of grace with God today. That's the blood between us and God today is the blood of Christ. <clears throat> Verse 9, then Moses went up also, and uh, I'm sorry, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire and stone. Now, I don't think that they saw, I know that they did not see, you know, the complete form and manifestation of God, but they saw an image of God. They got to see his feet. Because later Moses said, let me see you. And God said, you know, you don't understand. <laughs> you, you want to see me? You're going to die. You know, nobody, no man can see me without dying. And so what did he do? He stuck Moses in the cleft of a rock and, and he passed by. You know, I, can you imagine like if you got to get crammed in a little hole in an F-16 fighter jet, passed by it, you know, two feet away or something like, you know, and you just, the Shekinah glory was so intense. And, and God said, Moses, you can just kind of see the afterglow you know, after I go by. And, and that's what he did. And, um, and so they didn't want to, you know, see. And, of course, John tells us later that nobody has, you know, collectively seen God at any time. But, but they got to see an image, right? And they got to see an image of his feet. And, uh, and there was under his feet, as it were, paved work of sapphire stone. Sounds a lot like the description of heaven, right, in Revelation. And it was um, like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. And uh, either the eating and drinking is the, the commemorative feast that happened afterwards from the sacrifices, or... Or I thought maybe it's perhaps like the hospitals these days. When you go in for something, they want to make sure they want to see you eat and drink something and, and have a BM, right? They want to say, I want to make sure you're still alive before we let you go from here. And, uh, and I don't know which one it was after that. Maybe it's like, you know, and they lived. They got to see him and they lived or they got to see him and they went back for the feast. I'm not sure. So they saw God, they ate and drank in verse 12. And then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the, and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, first mentioned by the way, and, and Moses went up the mountain of God. And by the way, you know, like, much like leadership, you know that God's way is discipleship. It's discipleship, and all through Scripture, right, you just see this over and over and over and over that God likes to use people to work in people's lives. He could have excluded us from the Great Commission, right? He could have just said, okay, hang out, you know, and be good Christians, and I, my spirit will work independently of you to lead other people to Christ, and they can come join your club, right? No. He said, you're going to be my laborers, right? 
He's in the laborers for the harvest. And then he gave him the great commission, go, right, and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe, you know, whatsoever, you know, and, you know, that he wanted to use us. And, but I, I say that because that means two things. That means you need to be looking in your life to those who disciple you, and you need to be looking for those who you should disciple. You know, and, and enter into those kind of relationships and, you know, and maybe you don't know much or, you know, whatever it is, but I guarantee you there's somebody that you can help. There's somebody that you have more knowledge than, and there's somebody that you need to invest your life in and your care in, and you need to pick people out. You need to understand and, you know, and, and invest your life into people, you know, find a Joshua. Find whatever it is. You know, Titus says, let the older women teach the younger women. And, let, you know, and, then, and by the way, you know, all the examples in Scripture are men with men and women with women. And that's for good reason, right? And it should be that way. If you're, if you're a lady, well, find younger ladies, you know, and, and, and you know, work with them and try to influence them and encourage them in Christ. If, if you're a man, well, look for, you know, other men to invest your life in them. And by the way, it's, it's, it's very little time invested in them with them personally and a lot more time invested you know with god with them that you you look for people and you invest your life in people and you find people and you say you know god that young man you know maybe he would serve you and you begin praying for him and you've been caring for him and you interact with him and you talk to him and and, and you seek to do that very work because all through scripture that's the way God likes to work and you got to get with his program. You got to understand the way he wants to work. You know, and rather than just looking out and saying, Oh, I wish all those people would come to Christ, well, maybe pick out two or three and really invest some of your life in them and Pray for them and love them and encourage them and do all those things. That's, that's part of the Christian ministry. That's part of the, the work of the kingdom. But there was <clears throat> Moses and Joshua. And Moses went up the mountain of, uh, to God, and he said to the elders, <clears throat> Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. You know, sometimes we're a little upset that we have such simple experiences with God. You know, why, God, why doesn't God... Reveal something to me, you know. Why, didn't, why hasn't he really come out and shown me my spiritual gift? You know, why does he really come near to me and, and communicate with me? And, you know, and, and why? And, and we, you, you stop to realize, and if you look at the examples in scriptures, did you just, you just caught this, right? You know, that he went up there for six minutes, and on the seventh minute, boy, the Lord spoke to him, right? And that, you know, everybody likes 15-minute devotional, right? I mean, how, how, how quick can we get this, right? Or maybe 20-minute church service or something. Yeah, I remember there was a way back in, I mean, this was before I ever went to church, you know, before I had a relationship with the Lord. I remember a huge billboard in New Braunfels, Texas. And you know what their advertisement was? Such and such church, home of the 20-minute worship service. You can check that box pretty fast, can't you? I got that out of the way. Let me go about my day. And the truth is, is so often we get a pitiful experience with the Lord because we, get, we have a pitiful investment. You know, the Scripture teaches us that, you know, the one who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully, and the one who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. And that's not just for money, you know. It's not in that sense. I really don't believe that it's, you know, it's a financial principle at all. It may, you may sow financially, but God may let you reap in, in other ways and in other ways to be wealthy. But, you know, I think about this and I have my own anecdotal experience about this a number of times. Y'all know that I'm in the practice of going out in the middle of nowhere with no technology and nothing but a Bible. Because honestly, with who I am and the habits of my life and the distractions, and that's the only way that I can really get what I'm going for. 
And I have to do that because I know who I am. Some of it beyond my, you know, my personality. Some of it's just because I'm busy and I have a lot of people that message me and I own a business and there's church and there's all this stuff. And not, not to be bad, but I got to get away from y'all sometimes, you know. You know but, you know, there, there's, there's all that stuff. And, and, and if I tell myself that I'm going to invest four days in prayer in the Word of God here, no. It's not going to happen. Somebody will know where I am, even if it's my family. I mean, it's going to be interruptions. I'm going to be there for four hours, and I'm going to say, mm, okay, how about a little bit of, you know, I'm going to go work on this or something like that. And I can tell you, I, I, remember, I remember a couple of occasions, but one, one particularly, I went on, uh, I don't know how many miles it was. It was a five-day trip. I think I covered maybe close to 100 miles. And I went out because I wanted to spend time with the Lord. And I wanted to hear from the Lord. And I walked 20 miles in to the wilderness. And I camped there for several days, and I memorized uh, one of the Psalms, I think Psalm 24. And I spent time in prayer. And I spent time in prayer, and I, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, is there something wrong, God? I mean, it feels pretty lonely out here in the wilderness. And there, there really wasn't much. There's not what I'd hoped for. And, you know, the day came for me to head back. And I thought, you know, I'll go back a different way. And, I, you know, I had planned on, on going back a long way and staying overnight. I was going to go about 12 miles, stay overnight, and then go another 12 miles a different way. And I started heading back, and the first 12 miles, you know, I, I just thought about how, how disappointed I was that the Lord didn't really speak to me and come near to me. And I really, I mean, I don't know if y'all spent four days in prayer and memorizing scripture, but I thought I'd made a decent investment. And I made it the first 12 miles, and it was a rough 12 miles because there was no trail, and I had to go over a 10,000-foot pass, and, and it was rocky coming down the pass, and there was lots of black locust thorns. And, um, and I got to my stopping point where I was going to camp. My feet ached. And so I laid my pack down, and I pulled my shoes off, and I stuck them down in the cold creek to let them soak for a little while. While I was sitting there, a tree fell. <laughs> right? Just sitting there at a creek, this huge you know, pine tree, boom, right next to me. And I said, well, thank you, Lord, that I was here and not there. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and just something kind of stirred up in me, and I was like, you know what? I think I can make it. I think I can make, you know, and I, I put my shoes back on and, you know, Beans and I loaded up. We got a drink. We knew it was going to be a while before we had water again. And, and I, I kind of discounted it, whatever, you know, I'll be, you know, out and get the hot shower tonight, you know, and, and I started walking that second 12 mile. You know, that last four hours, last four or five hours of last 12 of 100 miles, I just got back on the trail and God just started to dump on me, just bless. I don't, you know, what, what is it anyway? It's not, it's not like it's any, you know, thing that he, just his presence. Just his presence to come near, and I just thought, you know, and I walking back, and I thought, boy, this, this four or five hours was worth the four days. Just for him to come and renew you and refresh you spiritually, and just, it's all the difference in the world. To take you from a place of discouragement to a place of hope, to a place from a place of depression to a place of joy, to no matter what the circumstance. And I'm telling you, I was not comfortable. I was not comfortable 
It was, it was a rough 24 miles that day. And here I am the second 12 miles of 24 miles and, you know, five days into this. And, but it was amazing to me, you know, that last 12 miles, you know, and I don't know, we just, we read about these incredible experiences, but we don't realize the offering, right? And the sacrifice and the time devoted to God and, you know, I mean, we think about now, you know, I'll go on a five-day fishing trip, you know, I'll go on a five-day mountaineering trip, I'll do a five-day this, five-day that, we're going on a five-day cruise, we're going to five, you know, you think about all the ways, I mean, we might just sit at home for five days during the holidays and veg and watch TV, play video games or, or whatever like that, but you ever, you ever set apart five days for the Lord? No TV, no phone, no interaction, just prayer and His Word, meditation. I look in Scripture and I see things like this, and boy, it makes sense to me. Six days and on the seventh day. That kind of offering. You know, that kind of devotion. He said, and he spoke, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud, and he went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly. With his heart you shall take my offering. You know, so, so often people think, you know, the as if like Thomas Jefferson thought the God of the Old Testament. I don't, I don't like that phrase, the God of the Old Testament. <laughs> as if it was different than the God of the New Testament, right? Is there, you mean God, you know? Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was Thomas Jefferson, right? He just, he couldn't, he was like Marcion, right? I don't know if y'all know the, 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 the theological figure of Marcion. You know, he was a very early, early church heretic that, came to the conclusion that, you know, that well, there was two different gods. There's two gods, you know, because they're not the same, you know. But, you know, they are the same, you know, what they aren't getting. You know, Thomas Jefferson was also one of those people in our history that he was like, mm, can't be, you know. And he even, like, came up with his own Bible, right, and he eliminated like 50% of it or something like that. But he was a bit of a heretic himself. But even the Old Testament, you know, that, uh, you know, I think people want to think of God as this, brutal dictator or something like that but but still when it came down to the worship of him and how did he put it here he didn't say from everyone you know he gives out of my dogma who I, who gives out of my mandate you know that's never the way that god wanted to have a relationship with man and there's much of that debate you know in christendom today especially in this country with Reformed theology, you know, and Reformed theology thinks of, of salvation more like fate. That God, you know, programmed you to choose him. But, you know, all through Scripture, and it's very difficult for me to accept, and because, you know, you see this even in the Old Testament, that, you know, God's not going to force himself into fellowship with him. But he told Moses, everyone who gives willingly with his heart, you shall take you know, my offering. Because God doesn't have any joy in somebody giving grudgingly, right? And he told them back then, <clears throat> and it's interesting, you know, what, really what the word is, that every, everyone who gives nadab, I think maybe some translations say of his own free will or something, uh, you know, out of the generosity of his heart or something like that, <laughs> It's kind of it's interesting, ironic, you know, here in, in the same context that the word is Nadab, and it's the same word as, as Aaron's son, Nadab. You know, and Aaron named his son Generous. You know, hey, Generous, come here. <laughs> you know? and, but it was, it's the same word. You know, one's a proper noun, Nadab, the name, and, and the accent marks are different, but it's the same word. You know, I think for uh, the name Nadab, it was Nadab, you know, and then this was Nadab. And, uh, yeah, there's another accent in the name, in the proper name. But that's what it means. That, you know, generously, freely, not under compulsion. You know, we have other scriptures like that. It was First uh, Chronicles 29. 
I'll flip to a couple. We'll do a little bit of Bible here. Sam, Samuel King's Chronicles. Twenty-nine, thirteen, regarding the temple. And he says, um, David's song here, he says, Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own, you know, we have given you, for we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as we are, uh, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow and without hope. And But he makes the point, he understands, that we should be able to offer so willingly as this. And it's strange that God has created that capacity and that element that, you know, I, you know, the scary thing is, is that God's not going to force you to do anything. If you're waiting for him to force you to do something, I can guarantee, I can assure you that that is no kind of relationship that God wants to have with you. That'd be like a, a wife telling her husband, you know, well, if you want to have any relationship with me, you're going to have to force me, you know. And you're like, well, I de- and I'm not going to have any joy in that kind of relationship. No, thank you. You know. I was hoping that it would buy me might be like a little bit mutual love, you know, and responsiveness. And but in, in, in the sense of force, it also uh, it's a Second Corinthians chapter nine. Y'all know this, I'm sure. I, I quoted part of it a little while ago. Second um, Corinthians nine, when Paul's talking to the Corinthians about you know giving their offering, and Second uh, Corinthians nine six. And he tells him this way, he says, But I say to you, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Anake is, is the, the Greek word there, and it really it means under compulsion, as if you had to do it. You know, there's one thing I can remember, you know, being in a church and they had their yearly financial thing. And, you know, and the pastor got up and he talked about all the money they were planning on spending that week. And then, you know, and, you know, and so we really need your faithful giving. And, and you know, and now I want all of you to write down on a piece of paper how much money you're going to give this week. And we're going to come and lay it on the altar. I would never do that. I would never do that. I would never try to manipulate or compel. And you read this and not under compulsion. And, you know, I might talk about the principle of giving and the, and the parts of it in Scripture and where God tells us to honor the Lord from our wealth and, you know, all the examples that are giving. But, you know, far be it from me. If you ever think that I'm, you know, trying to compulsively tell you to give, I mean, please tell me because that, that is not scriptural. God does not ever want you to be manipulated into giving anything to him. He wants you. In, and if you can't give it to him with good feelings and a good heart, with, you know, cheerfully, don't do it. He doesn't want it. Oh, you know, I could do something with this $200, you know. <clears throat> you know, God doesn't want it. No, thank you. Can you imagine what that would be like receiving a gift from, what if you're a little kid, you know, and, your parents buy your Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas, and it costs a lot. And we didn't want to buy it, but you know, whatever. Here's your Red Ryder. Wouldn't you love that? That's no blessing. If your child came to you and and they were going to do something for you, and they're just so bent out of shape that they had to do it, that's no blessing, is it? You think about even in the Old Testament when it came to those things, you know, it's. That was God saying, hey, if you want to participate in this, you know, good. You know, because that, that's a mark of faith, and that gives glory to God. When you believe that it's worth it, and when you believe that he's worth it, and you want to give, and that is the attitude of your heart, that gives glory to God, and it brings a blessing to him. Isn't that crazy? Do you have that capacity to bless God, <laughs> to do that? Like, that, that's amazing to me that us, like we, have that capacity to bless God. 
and say, God, I want, you know, I could, I could do all kinds of stuff with this, but I want to give it to you. I want to give it to your kingdom. I want to give it to your purpose. And, you know, for your thing, and, uh, you know, we have that scripture up there, you know, for, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And if, you know, and that, that's one of the litmus tests in our life. If you want to know what's, what's really valuable to you, look at your bank account. I'd say your checkbook, but so many of us, you know, we use debit cards today. You know, look at your bank account. And the things, you know, you, the, the, the priority of your money, boy, that really tells you about who you are and what you are. But he said, let it be, you know, with his heart, right? Willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And he said, um, oh, you know what? You know, think about the attitude with which you give what you say about God. If you give grudgingly, you know what you're saying? That God's an extortionist. Think about that. If that's really what's in your heart, or, or maybe, you know, this happens a lot in church. I don't know that y'all, I know this happens because I have to do with the counseling, right? You know that, and you know the way that re- it normally is? The wife wants to tie the income and the husband's like, Ugh. It, it does happen the other way, but not as often. It is pretty often that you find a lady, sometimes her husband doesn't go to church, and she wants to tie their income, and he's kind of bent out of shape about it. You know, and say, well, what do you say about God when, when you know, you give grudgingly? You th- you, what you're saying is God's an extortionist. Or, or what if you give just out of fear? That's another thing. Well, man, you know, I really don't want to tithe, but I'm afraid that, you know, God will bring a financial penalty on my life if I don't honor the Lord for my wealth. And now, you know, and then you're, you're not giving, you know, cheerfully. You're giving out of self-preservation. But then you communicate that God's a tyrant. Well, if I don't honor the Lord for my wealth, he's going to, you know, bring down judgment on me, you know. And, like, think about what you do. But when you give cheerfully, what do you think? Well, you know, I trust my Father. And I know that he's going to do better with this than I could do with it. And I want to honor him from every aspect of my life. And so that's the way it was in the Old Testament. That's the way it is in the New Testament. And he says, verse 3, And this is the offering which you shall take from them, gold and silver and bronze and blue and purple and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins, dyed red, badger skins and acacia wood, oil for the light, and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pat- the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, so that uh, just so you shall make it. And they make <clears throat> and they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall it be its length, a cubit and a half uh, its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold all around. Verse 12. You shall cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side, and two rings shall be on the other side. And you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles uh, shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put the ark of the testimony. I'm sorry. and, And you shall put into the ark of the testimony, which I give you. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width, and you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work, and you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the, <clears throat> and the other cherub at the other end, and you shall make cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and the ark uh, you shall put the testimony I will give you, and there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, 
which are on the ark of the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So he describes the ark, which we'll go into more, but today the mercy seat is the only thing I want to mention. And so the top of the ark was covered with the lid. That lid was called the mercy seat. On each end of the lid, there was a cherub. I don't know, you know, Hebrew 101, you want to make something plural in Hebrew, you put im on the end of it. You know, uh, Elo, El, Elohim. El is God, and Elohim is God's. You know, cherub is one cherub, and cherubim are two or more. You know, plural. And, you know, so they had a cherub on each end, right, facing the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was the place on which he sprinkled the blood. And so that's what this was used for once a year, Yom Kippur. And by the way, that, you know, what that mercy seat is called is a kaparet. That's what it's called, kaparet. And you're like, well, what's, you'll hear the similar word there, kapur, kapur, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. It's the place of atonement, the kaparet. That place of atonement. And that's the place when Yom Kippur that they would come in and they would put the blood on the mercy seat. Now back to how we come to know God. I guess you could ask why we come to know God, and that's because he chose to create us. And not only did he choose to create us, but he chose to create us and then to make a way for us to have fellowship with him. And he allowed for us to come into the capacity to have the knowledge of good and evil, And he allowed for us to have a capacity of choice. Like he said many times in Scripture, like through Joshua, choose you this day, this day whom you will serve. And like Jesus said in the Gospel of John, if any man is willing, right? Or as he said in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open... And he, he fabricated this all of existence that he might be our God and that we might be his people is one way he put it in Scripture. Another way that Jesus put it in John 14 is that where I am, there you may be also. And we get it, right? We understand what it's like, you know, and I think most of us as adults, we want to live, you know, around our kids and we want to have our kids close to us and we want to have our grandkids close to us. And and we want to be close to those whom we love. And God is not different than that. Why? Why? Why do we want to know God and why does he want to know us? Because he has a love and an affection for us. And that's what he created, that opportunity to, to be restored unto him. But, you know, and then there's I guess there's the question of how. You know, how do we know God? You know, and the knowledge of God is, is both instructional and it's anecdotal. You know, there, there's definitely an area of, of theology, especially Reformed theology and, you know, really hard conservatism that, that doesn't like any kind of idea of experiential or anecdotal knowledge of God, but that's not scriptural. You know, I give you a few examples if you want. As uh, I think it's uh, Acts chapter ten, Simon. You know, God sent a, a vision to a, um, a centurion named Cornelius, and he said, "You know, send somebody to Joppa to Simon the Tanner's house." You know, and there's a guy named Simon there, Simon and Simon, but not the '80s show. You all know, remember that? You know, where they jumped the blazer in the beginning. You know, and you know, Simon. And some of y'all don't remember Simon, Simon, but anyway, but it was Simon and Simon in Joppa, right? And uh, you know, and God said, Cornelius, send somebody and go get him. And Simon, Peter, right, the apostle was there and he was up on the roof and he was meditating. And, and he knew very well because three times in it teaches in the Old Testament that God is no respecter of persons and God is no respecter of persons and God is no respecter of persons. And, and he knew very well that, you know, that Ruth, well, she wasn't a Jew, you know, and uh, Rahab, well, she wasn't a Jew either. Right? You see lots of examples and lots of situations. And, and he knew the word of the Lord, and he knew God in that sense. He knew it instructionally. But, you know, but then how did he come to know God even more? Experientially. 
And he was there and he was meditating. And God, you know, y'all probably know the story that he lowered down a sheet with a bunch of fried shrimp and, and pork ribs and all kinds of, you know, good stuff. And, you know, and he said, eat. And Peter said, uh-uh, you know, that's not kosher. Right. And, you know, and he had to go through it three times. And finally, God told him, listen, you don't call unclean what I've made clean. Okay. Well, arrives the, the messenger from Cornelius. Well, it's time to go talk to shrimp and pork ribs, Gentiles. Right? <laughs> and so here Peter goes and he shows up to Cornelius' house. And, and you know what he says? Now I know for certain that God is no respecter of person. You know, later, I, I don't remember exactly what it says. It's in Second Peter. He gave us another example. <clears throat> You know, how, how do we get to know God? How do we grow in this relationship with him? <clears throat> you know, the worst thing about fine print Bibles is that you can pass up a little book like that. You know, you know you're like, no, no, I'm past, you know, but yeah, that's how I like that big print. Sometimes it's easier to find. But Second uh, Peter 1.16, <clears throat> he gives an account, right, of the... Um, Oh, that's First Peter. I didn't do good in Bible drill, by the way. Second Peter one sixteen. There we go. That looks familiar. <clears throat> Here he gives this account. He said, "For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ." He said, "But we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty, for He received from God the." Father, honor, and glory, when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. You know what Peter just said? You know how I know the Lord Jesus Christ? I know it by the word of God, and I know by my experience with God. You know, there's even two words given us in the New Testament. There's logos, which is this written word, and there's rhema, which is like a communicated word. You know, the Lord spoke to me the other day. You know, and you mean audibly? Well, maybe, I don't know. He doesn't speak to me audibly, but, but he speaks to me. Sometimes, not really often, you know. And, but, you know, that's, that's how we know God. And, you know, we can read his word. You know what the way, the way Jesus taught us in, in the Gospel of John? He said, you know, uh, that, that the one who loves him and keeps his commandments, that will be loved by him and will be loved by his Father. And he said, you know what, and, and my Father will manifest himself to him. And we know about God by reading the Bible, Right? We know about God by reading the Bible. We know God by obeying the Bible, by obeying Him and having those experiences with Him and spending time with Him. You know what? I, what if I said, you know, Daniel doesn't like history? He'd say, well, you don't know Daniel. No, well, Carrie's a homebody, right? <laughs> you don't know Carrie, you know. You know, I said, well, Pastor David doesn't like to study. You're like, well, you're mistaken. You don't know these men. You've obviously never spent time with them because they have a personality and they have character, and you don't have any experience with them. That's what it's like. That you've got to take the Word of God and spend time with God through the experience of your life with God and have a testimony, right, with Him, and, you know, those how, that's how we know God. Peter said, listen, you know, it's, you know, I know, I know what the Word said, and then I know what the Lord took me through. Twice. And he said, I know what the Word says, and I know what we saw in that Mount of Transfiguration. And we have the prophetic made more, more sure, the prophetic Word made more sure, which you'd, be, do, you'd do well to give heed to. But, you know, the question really to answer is where? Where do we meet God? And, you know, we may have our geographical location, like, oh, it was in my apartment when I was 21 or something like that. But, but there's an abstract location that's all the same for us. Abstractly, we all met God in one place, and that was the mercy seat. That's what he told Moses there 
at the very end of what I just read. Verse 22, and he says, And and there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. That's the place, Moses, that connects man to God. And you're like, man, we got to find this ark. Well, no, the ark was typological. It wasn't really, that, that wasn't, uh, but, but that was typological of something. But what was it? Well, turn to John chapter 20, the gospel of John. I'll back up just a little bit to give context. John 20. So now the first day of the week, this is after he was crucified and put in the tomb. Now the first day of the week, that's why we meet on this day, by the way, Mary and Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter. See, John was faster, wasn't he? And he came to the tomb first and and he stooping down looked in and he saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths and lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down. And looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laid. You tell me what's the mercy seat. The example given for Moses, it was the blood of oxen that went in there and was put onto that mercy seat where those two cherubim faced. But you know, really, ultimately, what it was, and for each of us, it was that bloody body of Christ that was wrapped up in claws and taken in there and laid down, one at the head and one at the foot. That's That's the place where we meet God. There's no other place, no other provision that can restore you and connect you to a holy and a righteous God other than that place, that body, that sacrifice. That's the real blood of the covenant. That's the real place. And I think if we could even... Soak in the reality of it. I don't even know that we want to because it's so heartbreaking. If we could watch our own loved one, our own son, our own daughter, just get the snot beat out of them, be a bloody pulp, and be limp, dying, hanging on a cross, and have a spear shoved in their side, and blood and water gush out. And then before rigor mortis sets in, and while they can still manipulate the body, take them down and wrap them up, I guarantee you there was blood soaking through those claws. They wrapped them up and they set them on that seat. That was the mercy seat. Where they put them into that tomb, and there was, what, two angels. One at the head and one at the foot. That's the place. That's the only place, figuratively, that we can know him. And let's pray. Father, Lord, give us enough 
enough sobriety to understand the reality, God. And bring it near unto us, Lord. The reality of our covenant with you, that it was not... It was not Cracker Jack cost. What a provision that you made for us and forgive us for being so flippant and so careless, Lord, with the lives, God, that you've given us, the breath, Lord, the heart beating, the opportunity, God, to know you. God caused us to realize enough the price that was paid, Lord, that we wouldn't be so goofy and careless and so flippant and apathetic, God, about bumbling through this life and so caught up in the things of this world. God, how you must love us to do what you've done and to make that provision. Lord, let us not count the blood of that covenant, Lord, a common thing, an ordinary. But I pray that you would stir us up, God, and make us mindful, Lord, that we might live a sanctified life, God, and reserve these vessels, Lord, for your purpose, and prepare us, God, for the season and the times to come, Lord, that we might be faithful in the day of temptation. That we would not compromise, Lord, regarding the testimony of Christ, but that we would be faithful witnesses, God. Just like he was, Lord, counting the joy to come to be greater. Lord, we confess that we're pilgrims and that our inheritance and our reward is in heaven. But God, how we sure do get distracted from that and live as if it's the here and now. Lord, make us to be vessels, laborers, soul winners, sowers and harvesters, God, light shiners, Lord, just what you intended for us to be. I pray for your intervention in our lives, God. I pray for your blessing upon these, God, and with an abundant grace and long-suffering, Lord, and to continue with each of them, God, for your perfect will and your desire for them, God, and doing in them, doing in us, God, what we would never do of ourselves, Lord, that we might have an account and a testimony like... Uh, Peter said, a, a reason for the hope that is within us. Make us to be different, God. Lord, as so many of our conservative friends are in some kind of fearful frenzy and rant and all these things, God, let us be confident in you. Let us be sure of our future, unwavering, not freaked out. And God, may that be a testimony of hope and an example of value, God, the value that's in a relationship with you to those around us, God. Lord, I pray that you be pleased with us. We want to hear those words, good and faithful servant. Or like the Father said to you, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That is our desire and our hope is in you for it. In Christ's name, amen.